Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the Meeting of Catholic. My name is Nicholas Cavazos, a.k.a. the traditional Thomist. Jesus is King. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the Meeting of Catholic, the Sunday sermons of St. Alphonsus Liguori. It's so good to have you guys here. Hope you guys are doing well on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We are right at the end, right at the end of Advent already. Time really flies. You know, when I was a kid, I remember it just seemed like from the period of the day after Christmas to the next Christmas took forever, right? It was just a season that seemed to never, never last. And then Christmas Day, you know, was a time of bliss and joy and presence. And it lasted like that, you know, it was just so incredibly quick. Uh, but now as I've gotten older, right, I'm in my mid twenties, uh, I, I recognize how quick life is starting to go by even already right now. It's something that, uh, on the one hand is interesting, but it's more scary than anything else because I'm recognizing, wow, there's so much I want to do and so little time to do it. However, I'm here with you. And so I'd love to spend a little bit of my life, right, with you here today on the meaning of Catholic to talk a little bit about the love of Jesus Christ for you, the individual. That's what today's subject is going to be, the love of Jesus Christ, the most beautiful truth of our Christian faith, of our Catholic faith. Before we dive into specifically um, St. Alphonse's sermon for today, as we're closing out this season of Advent, I'm wanting us to meditate on this truth of the love of Christ, but I want us to meditate it on for maybe a reason um, for which maybe some of us aren't expecting. So many of us have heard the phrase, especially if you were brought up in the church or any type of Christian ensemble, the phrase, Christ loves you or Jesus loves you. This is true, all well and good, but many times that phrase, the weightiness of that phrase, flies over our head because we don't oftentimes just break down that real reality of what does it mean for who is Jesus, right? And how does he love me and who am I? The thing is, my friends, I've recognized um, over my brief short lifespan that this is the most beautiful and wonderful truth. And the reason that it's the most beautiful and wonderful truth, which we'll get into a little bit at the end of this sermon, is the reality that Christ, who is infinite, who is all good, who is all lovely, who is all kind, who is all filled with joy and happiness, who desires nothing but the best for me, gave himself not just on a cross, but gave himself to me when I needed him the most. But I did not know that I needed him the most until I recognized who I was. That's a real reality that I think a lot of Catholics have forgotten, is this reality of who am I, right? Who am I? And I think the thing is, is that when we really start to ask ourselves the question, who am I? And when we start to really examine that in light of uh, Catholic tradition, with sacred scripture, with what the saints have said, we recognize the answer is very uncomfortable. The answer is, is that we are fundamentally, right, not good in the sense of the morals that we practice, in the sense of the actions that we do, in specifically our nature, our fallen nature. Now, of course, Christ can make us good, right? Christ raises dead men to life. How much more spiritual wickedness does he change into spiritual goodness? But that is still a fact that many of us, because of pride, because of egoism, because of vanity, don't want to admit. We don't like to admit this idea that we are sinners, that we are fallen, that we are flawed. We don't like to admit that because if we admit that, then the whole facade that we are putting forward for our fellow man completely falls apart and they see us as we are. And if we see us as we are and we are terrified of that reality, how much more so will other people? And how much infinitely more so will an all-powerful and holy God who, according to the words of the book of Job, right, the heavens and the stars themselves are not pure in the sight of the Lord, how much so, more so the sons of men who drink iniquity like water? We have to recognize that because of these realities, it's uncomfortable. But when we understand, my friends, the reality of our sin and that the fact that Christ died for us, right, that he fulfilled the justice of the law that we could never fulfill, that 
is what gives me great hope and great joy and should give you great hope and great joy. So if you don't feel like during this Advent season, you have much joy or much hope, I'm hoping that just a little bit today, by the power of God's grace, we're able through this show, right, through this broadcast, to give you a little bit of hope and to give you a little bit of joy, to recognize in your heart and in your soul and in your mind and in the actions that you do that Christ loves you and that Christ wants you to love fellow man. So we're going to go ahead now, and we're going to dive into specifically the readings for today, Sunday. Again, as always, I use the St. Andrew Daily Missal because you get the good readings as well as great commentary on the readings. But then we're going to dive into the sermon by St. Alphonsus and conclude with some of my own concluding thoughts. All right, everyone, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas for Light and Guidance O ineffable Creator, who, out of the abundance of thy wisdom, hast constituted the three angelic hierarchies, and hast set them in admirable order over the highest heaven, thou who hast graciously proportioned the parts of the universe, thou who art called the true font of light and wisdom, and the first beginning of all, begin to let the beam of thy splendor shine upon the darkness of mine intellect, to dispel the twofold gloom of sin and ignorance in which I was born. Make my tongue to speak wise things, O thou who makest eloquent the tongues of babes. Do thou pour out upon my lips the grace of thy benediction. Give me keenness and comprehension, ability to retain, method and ease in acquiring, precision in interpreting, plenteous grace in speaking. Inspire my going in, and guide my steps when I walk. And my going out do thou make perfect, thou who art once God and man, who reignest forever and ever. Amen. Prayer to St. Thomas Aquinas. O blessed Thomas, patron of schools, obtain for us from God an invincible faith, burning charity, and a chaste life, and a true knowledge, through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. St. Dominic, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen the fourth Sunday of Advent. John preaching the baptism of penance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Commentary by Dom Gaspar Lefebvre, Order of St. Benedict. Like the whole liturgy of this season, the purpose of the Mass for the fourth Sunday of Advent is to prepare us for the twofold coming of Christ, his coming in mercy at Christmas, and injustice at the end of the world. Allusion is made to the first in the intuit, the gospel, the offertory, and the communion, and to the second in the epistle, while the collect, gradual, and alleluia can be applied to either of the two. In this Mass, we meet once again with the three great figures that are before the mind of the Church throughout Advent, Isaiah, St. John the Baptist, and Our Lady. The prophet Isaiah foretells of St. John the Baptist that he will be, quote, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God, end quote. And, quote, the word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert, And he came into the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins, end quote. Thus as seen in today's gospel. Quote, John, 
St. Gregory exclaims, told those who hurried in the crowds to be baptized, quote, Ye brood of vipers, who hath told you to flee from the wrath to come? Now the wrath to come is the final chastisement, which the sinner will not be able to escape unless he have recourse to the lamentations of penance. The friends of the bridegroom warns us to bring forth not fruits merely of penance, but worthy fruits. These words are a call to each man's countenance, binding him, lay up by means of penance, a treasure of good works, the greater in proportions to the revenger of sins which caused it, as is seen in the third nocturne. And St. Leo says, quote, God himself teaches us by the prophet Isaiah, I will lead the blind in the way that they will know not, and I will turn their darkness before them into light, I will not forsake them, end quote. The Apostle St. John makes clear to us that the way in which this mystery is fulfilled when he says, quote, And we know that the Son of God is come, and he hath given us his understanding, that we may know the true God and may be his true Son, end quote, thus as seen in the second nocturne. The liturgy continues. Because of this great love that God has manifested towards us, he sent on earth his only begotten son to be born of the Virgin Mary. Also of the communion sentence, the church recalls to us the prophecy of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. And again in the offertory, she combines in a single salutation the words addressed to Our Lady by the archangel and by St. Elizabeth. St. Gregory writes, quote, Gabriel, whose name means the strength of God, is sent to Mary since he comes to announce the Messiah's, whose will it is to appear in humiliation and abasement in order to subdue all the powers of the air. It was fitting that he should be the herald by Gabriel, quote, the strength of God, he who it was to come as the Lord of might, the almighty powerful, the unconquerable in battle, to crush the powers of the air in a universal defeat. This is taken from St. Gregory's Sermon, number 35. In the Collect, just as we are reminded of the display of our Lord's, quote, great might, which will take place at the time of his second coming, when, as a supreme judge, he will come in splendor of his divine majesty to render to each one according to his works, so we find an allusion to this same great power manifested in his first coming. It was as one clothed in his weak and mortal frame nature that our Lord put the devil to flight. As we think of our Lord as nigh at hand in one or another of his comings, in one or in another of his comings, let us say with the church, quote, Come, Lord Jesus, tarry not. Every parish priest celebrates Mass for the people of his parish. The station for this Mass is at the Church of the Twelve Apostles. The Introit, taken from Isaiah 45, verse 8. Commentary With sighs of longing, Isaiah foretold the deliverance of Israel by means of metaphors taken from nature. He compares this deliverance to a precious seed committed to the soil to be made fertile by rain and dew. This fertile soil, saturated with blessings, is Mary. Our Lord himself is the blessed fruit, which springs from the virgin soil. The verse is a messianic psalm in which David enlarges upon the metaphor employed by Isaiah. The heavens show forth the glory of the Lord, for Christ, the divine Son, is soon to come like a giant to run his course, and nothing will escape his light and his fiery heat. The Introit. Drop down, do ye heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain, the just. Let the earth be opened and bud forth a Savior. The heavens show forth the glory of God, and the firmament declareth the works of his hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Drop down, do ye heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain, the just. Let the earth be opened and bud forth the Savior. The Collect. 
Commentary The Lord, says Isaiah, shall go forth as a mighty man to battle. He shall prevail against his enemies, as says the third lesson for this Tuesday in Martins. And truly, as in his first, so as in his second coming, our Lord will snatch us from Satan's power. Quote, to the mercy of God alone, who has loved us, we owe a great blessing to our redemption. End quote. Taken from the fifth lesson of Martins. The Collect. Stir up thy power and come, we pray thee, O Lord, and with great might succor us that our deliverance, which our sins impede, may be hastened by the help of thy grace and the forgiveness of thy mercy, who livest and reignest with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost. God, roll without end. Amen. The second collect, taken from the additional collects of the season, during Advent, of the Blessed Virgin. O God, who hast willed that thy word should take flesh at the message of an angel, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, grant us thy servants, that we who believe her, to be truly the mother of God, may be helped by her intercession, through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The third collect, against the persecutors of the church. We beseech thee, O Lord, mercifully to receive the prayers of thy church, that all adversity and error, being destroyed, she may serve thee in security and freedom, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, and God, world without end. Amen. The Epistle, taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-5. through 5. Commentary St. Paul reproaches the faithful for preferring one preacher of the gospel to another. Are they not all dispensers of the mystery of Christ? Of what is required of the minister, but that he should not be found faithful in earth, in distributing to each according to his need? Now, if it does not belong to any earthly tribunal to pass judgment as to know the fidelity of the ministers of Christ, for the sovereign judge alone knows the innermost hearts of men, and he is who will return to judge us at the last day. We must not pass unfavorable judgments upon our neighbor if we wish Almighty God's judgment for ourselves not to be adverse. This passage recalls the Advent ordinations and the general message of the Advent season. A lesson from the epistle of Blessed Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. Brethren, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now it is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. But to me it is a very small thing to be judged by you or by man's day. But neither do I judge my own self, for I am not conscious to myself of anything. Yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge not therefore the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light and the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of their hearts. And then shall every man have praise from God. The Gradual, taken from Psalm 144, verses 18 and 21. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name. Alleluia, alleluia. Come, O Lord, and tarry not. Forgive the sins of thy people Israel. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel, taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Commentary. The central event in the history of the world is about to take place. In accordance with Isaiah's prophecy, St. John the Baptist is about to introduce the Messiah to the world, and it is of the first importance to determine the historical moment when this took place. The Holy Gospel A continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother, tetrarch of Eritur, and of, and of the country of Trontius and Lysias, tetrarch of Abilena, under the high priest Ananias and Caiaphas. The word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert, 
And he came into the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins. As it was written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Offertory, taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 28. Commentary With the angel Gabriel and St. Elizabeth, salute Our Lady, the living tabernacle of our Lord, for whom we wait. Hail, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. The Secret Look down favorably upon these sacrifices, O Lord, we beseech thee, that they may be profitable to our devotion and salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The second secret for the Blessed Virgin Mary. We beseech thee, O Lord, to strengthen in our minds the mysteries of the true faith, that we who confess him, who was conceived of the Virgin, may be true God and man, may by the power of his saving resurrection merit to attain eternal joy. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The third secret, against the persecutors of the church. Protect us, O Lord, who assist at thy mysteries, that fixed upon these things divine, we may serve thee in both body and mind, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Communion Verse Taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. The Post-Communion Prayer Having received thy gifts, we beseech thee, O Lord, that with the frequentation of the mysteries, the work of our salvation may increase. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Post-Communion for the Blessed Virgin Mary For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom have known the incarnation of Christ thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Post-Communion Against the Persecutors of the Church we beseech thee, O Lord our God, that thou wouldest not suffer to be exposed to human dangers, those whom thou gavest to rejoice in this divine banquet, through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. Sermon 4 For the fourth Sunday of Advent On the love of Jesus Christ for us, and on our obligation to love him. Quote, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God, end quote. Luke chapter 3, verse 6. The Savior of the world, whom according to the prediction of the prophet Isaiah, men were one day to see him on this earth, quote, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God, has already come, end quote. We have not only seen him conversing among men, but we have also seen him suffering and dying for the love of us. Let us, then, this morning consider the love which we owe to Jesus Christ, at least through gratitude for the love which he bears to us. In the first point, we shall consider the greatness of the love which Jesus Christ has shown us, and in the second, we shall see the greatness of our obligation to love him. The first point, on the great love which Jesus Christ has shown to us. Quote, Christ, says St. Augustine, came on earth that men might know how much God loves them. End quote. He has come, 
and to show the immense love which this God bears us, he has given himself entirely to us by abandoning himself to all the pains of this life and afterwards to the scourges, to the thorns, and to the, all the sorrows and insults which he suffered in his passion, and by offering himself to die, abandoned by all men, on the infamous tree of the cross, quote, who loved me and delivered himself for me, end quote. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus Christ could save us without dying on the cross and without suffering. One drop of his blood would be sufficient for our redemption. Even a prayer offered to his eternal father would be sufficient. Because of this account of his divinity, his prayer would be of infinite value and would therefore be sufficient for the salvation of the world and of the thousands of worlds. Quote, but, as St. John Chrysostom says, what was sufficient for our redemption was not sufficient for his love. End quote. To show how much he loved us, he wished to shed not only part of his blood, but the entirety of it by a dint of torment. This may be inferred. This may be inferred from the words which he used on the night before his death. Quote, this is my blood of the New Testament, which shall be shed for many. End quote. Matthew chapter twenty six verse twenty eight. The words shall be shown that his passion, the blood of Jesus Christ, was poured forth even to the last drop. Hence, when after death his side was opened with his spear, blood and water came forth, as if what then flowed was all the remission of his blood. Jesus Christ, then, though he could save us without suffering, wished to embrace a life of continual pain and to suffer the cruel and ignominious death of the cross. Quote, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death the cross, end quote. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Quote, Greater love than this no man hath than a man lay down his life for his friends, end quote. John chapter 15, verse 13. To show his love for us, what more could the Son of Man do than die for us? What more can a man do for another than give his life for him? Quote, greater love than this no man hath, end quote. Tell me, my brother, if one of your servants, if the vilest man on this earth had done for you what Jesus Christ had done in dying through pain on a cross, could you remember his love for you and not love him? St. Francis of Assisi appeared to be unable to think of anything but the passion of Jesus Christ, and in thinking of it, he continually shed tears so that by his constant weeping, he became nearly blind. Being found one day weeping and groaning at the foot of the crucifix, he was asked the cause of his tears and lamentations. He replied, quote, I weep over the sorrows and the ignominies of my Lord. And what makes me weep still more is that men for whom he has suffered so much live in forgetfulness of him. End quote. O oh, Christian, should a doubt ever enter your mind that Jesus Christ loves you, raise your eyes and look at him hanging on the cross. Ah, as St. Thomas of Villanova, the cross to which he is nailed, the internal and external sorrows which he endures, and the cruel death which he suffers for you are convincing proofs of the love which he bears for you. Do you not, says St. Bernard, Hear the voice of that cross and of those wounds crying out to make you feel that he truly loves you? St. Paul says that the love which Jesus Christ has shown in condescending to suffer so much for our salvation should excite us to his love more powerfully than the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the painful journey to Calvary, the agony of the three hours on the cross, the buffets, the spitting of his face, and all other injuries to which the Savior endured. According to the Apostle, the love which Jesus has shown us not only obliges, 
but in a certain manner forces and constrains us to love a God whom has loved us so much. Quote, for the charity of Christ preteth us, end quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. On this text, St. Francis of Sales says, quote, We know that Jesus, the true God, has loved us so as to suffer death, and even the death of the cross, for our salvation. Does not this love put our hearts, as it were, under a press, to force from them love by violence, which is stronger in proportion as it is more amiable? End quote. So great was the love which inflamed the enamored heart of Jesus that he not only wished to die for our redemption, but during his whole life he sighed ardently for the day on which he should suffer the death for the love of us. Hence, during his life, Jesus used to say, quote, I have a baptism wherewith I am to be ba I have a baptism wherewith I am to be baptized, and how am I straightened until he be accomplished? End quote. Luke chapter 12, verse 50. In my passion, I am to be baptized with the baptism of my own blood, but to wash away the sins of men. Quote, and how am I straightened? End quote. How, says St. Ambrose, explaining this passage, am I straightened by the desire of the speedy arrival of the day of death? Hence, on the night before his passion, he said, quote, with desire I have desired to eat this pasch with you before I suffer, end quote. Luke chapter 22, verse 15. Quote, we have, says St. Loris Justinian, seen wisdom become foolish through an excess of love, end quote. We have, he says, seen the Son of God become, as it were, a fool through the excessive love which he bore to men. Such, too, was the language of the Gentiles when they heard the apostle preaching that Jesus Christ suffered death for the love of men. Quote, but we, says St. Paul, preach Christ crucified unto the Jews and indeed a stumbling block unto the Gentiles' foolishness. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. Who, they exclaimed, can believe that a God most happy in himself and who stands in need of no one should take human flesh and die for the love of men who are his creatures? This would be to believe that God became foolish for the love of men. Quote, it appears folly, says St. Gregory, that the author of life should die for men. End quote. But whatever infidels may wish or think, it is a faith that the Son of God has shed all his blood for the love of us, to wash away the sins of our souls. Quote, who hath loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, end quote. Apocalypse chapter 1 verse 5. Hence, the saints were struck dumb with astonishment at the consideration of the love of Jesus Christ. At the sight of the crucifix, St. Francis of Paul could do nothing but exclaim, Love, love, quote, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto death, end quote. John chapter 13, verse 1. This loving Lord was not content with showing us his love by dying on a cross for our salvation. But at the end of his life, he wished to leave us his own very flesh for the food of our souls, that thus he might unite himself entirely to us. Quote, take ye and eat. This is my body. End quote. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. But of this gift and this excess of love, we shall speak at another time, entreating of the most holy sacrament of the altar. Let us pass to the second point. The second point, on the greatness of our obligation to love Jesus Christ. He who loves wishes to be loved. Quote, when, says St. Bernard, God loves, he desires nothing else than to be loved, end quote. The Redeemer said, quote, I am come to cast fire upon the earth, and what will I but that it is kindled? End quote. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. I, says Jesus Christ, came on earth to light up the fire of divine love in the hearts of men, and what will I but that it be kindled? 
God wishes nothing else from us than to be loved. Hence the Holy Church prays in the following words, quote, We beseech thee, Lord, that thy spirit may inflame us with the fire which Jesus Christ casts upon the earth, and which he vehemently wished to be kindled. End quote. Ah, what have not the saints, inflamed with this fire, accomplished? They have abandoned all things, delights, honors, the purple and the scepter, and all that they might burn with this holy fire. But you will ask, what are you to do, that you may be inflamed with the love of Jesus Christ? Imitate David. Quote, in my meditation a fire shall flame out, end quote. Psalm chapter 38. Meditation is the blessed furnace in which the holy fire of divine love is kindled. Make mental prayer every day. Meditate on the passion of Jesus Christ, and doubt not, but you too shall burn with this blessed flame. St. Paul says that Jesus Christ died for us to make himself the master of all of our hearts. Quote, to this end Christ dies and rode again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. In quote. Romans chapter 14, verse 9. He wished, says the apostle, to live his life for all men without a single expectation, without a single exception, that not even one should live any longer to himself, but that all might live only to God who condescended to die for them. Quote, and Christ died for all, that they also who live may not now live to themselves but unto him who died for them, end quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. Ah, to correspond to that love of this God, it would be necessary that another God should die for him, as Jesus Christ died for us. In gratitude of men, a God has condescended to give his life for their salvation, and they will not even think on what he has done for them. Ah, if each of you thought frequently on the sufferings of the Redeemer and on the love which he has shown to us in his passion, how could you but love him with all your whole heart? To him who sees with a lively faith the Son of God suspended by three nails on a, the infamous gibbet, every wound of Jesus Christ speaks and says, quote, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. End quote. Love man, the Lord thy God, who has loved thee so intently. Quote, who can resist such tender expressions? The wounds of Jesus Christ, says St. Bonaventure, wound the hardest hearts and inflame frozen souls. Oh, if you knew the mysteries of the cross, says St. Andrew the Apostle, to the tyrant by whom he was tempted to deny Jesus Christ, Tyrant, if you knew the love which your Savior has shown you by dying on the cross for your salvation, instead of tempting me, you would abandon all the goods of the earth to give yourself to the love of Jesus Christ. I conclude, my most beloved brethren, by recommending to you henceforth to meditate every day on the passion of Jesus Christ. I shall be content if you daily devote this meditation a quarter of an hour. Let each, let each at least procure a crucifix. Let him keep it in his room, and from time to time give it a glance at it and say, Ah, my Jesus, thou hast died for me, and I do not love thee. End quote. Had a person suffered for a friend's injuries, buffets, and prisons, he would greatly he would be greatly pleased to find that they were remembered and spoken of with gratitude. But he should be greatly displeased if the friend whom he had been born were unwilling to think or hear of his sufferings. Thus, frequent meditation on this passion is very pleasing to our Redeemer, but the neglect of this greatly provokes his displeasures. Oh, how great will this consolation, which we shall receive in our last moments from the sorrows and the death of Jesus Christ, if, during this life, we shall have frequently meditated on them with love. Let us not wait till others, at the hour of our death, place our hands on the crucifix. Let us not wait till they remind us of all that Jesus Christ suffered for us. Let us, during life, embrace Jesus Christ crucified, 
Let us keep ourselves always united to him, that we may live and die with him. He who practices devotion to the passion of our Lord cannot but be devoted to the dolors of Mary, the remembrance of which will be to us a source of great consolation at the hour of death. How profitable and sweet the meditation of Jesus on the cross. Oh, how happy the death of him who dies for the embrace of Jesus crucified, accepting death with cheerfulness for the love of that God who has died for the love of us. O oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because of thy just punishment, because I fear the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all because they have offended thee, my God, who are it all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins, do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. Prayer to Obtain Final Perseverance from Jesus and Mary. Eternal Father, I humbly adore thee. I humbly adore and thank thee for having created me and for having redeemed me by the means of Jesus Christ. I thank thee for having made me a Christian by giving me the true faith and by adopting me for thy child in holy baptism. I thank thee for having given me time for repentance after my many sins and for having, as I hope, pardon from all my offenses against thee. O oh, infinite goodness, I thank thee also for having preserved me from falling again, as often as I should have done, if thou hadst not held me up and saved me. But my enemies do not cease to fight against me, nor will they until death, that they may have me for their slave, if thou dost keep and help me continually by thy assistance. I shall be wretched enough to lose thy grace anew. I therefore pray thee for the love of Jesus Christ to grant me holy perseverance till death. Thy son Jesus has promised that thou wilt grant us whatever we ask for by his name. By the merits then of Jesus Christ, I beg thee for myself and for all those who are in thy grace, the grace of never more being separated from thy love, but that we may always love thee in this life and in the next. Mary, Mother of God, pray to Jesus for me. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. St. Dominic, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The love of Jesus Christ, my friends, is a mystery and is a truth that not only surpasses all understanding on this earth now, but that through a billion lifetimes of contemplation and study, we could never even be able to wrap our hands around the foothill, the smallest rocks of the foothill of the mountain of Christ's love for us. Christ's love for us is an ocean that we, through a billion years of study, could not even grab a drop of. This is something, my friends, that I'm wanting us all to meditate on in this season of Advent. We're meditating on the truths of Christ's incarnation, but recognizing that his incarnation was meant also for our salvation. The incarnation was those steps that Christ took to go to the cross. So in this season of Advent, while we're justly and rightly celebrating this happy season and meditating on these mysteries, let us share the love of God with other people. And if you struggle receiving the love of God, if you struggle to feel the love of God, let me remind you of a great spiritual truth that I've learned. The love of God is something that you receive with your intellect. It's something that we receive and we believe. Many times, Catholics will receive great consolations, but consolations are fleeting, my friends, and we should not live on them. Consolations, for those of you who do not know, are sometimes the spiritual fuzzies, the spiritual highs, if you will. We should not live on those things. Rather, we should be comforted in the knowledge that Jesus Christ loves us. Because in the knowledge, if we know it, then when we're going through down times or dark seasons, we can hold on to that knowledge. And if you feel like you struggle loving Christ because of your sins or because of some situation in your life, I recommend to daily call out for him. 
the biggest tip I can give you is the tip that St. Alphonsus gave in the sermon to devote your life to mental prayer at least 20 to 30 minutes every day. Give yourself to holy prayer. Meditate on scripture. Pray the mysteries of the rosary and you shall be saved. All right, my friends, thank you so much for joining with me today on this fourth Sunday of Advent. I definitely enjoyed it. Hope you guys did as well. Real quick before we end, uh, go ahead if you have not already and give this show a like. And if you're not part of The Meaning of Catholic, go ahead and consider subscribing to this channel. It's a great channel of uh, a lot of amazing people that I get the privilege to do shows with. And so, uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, leave us a subscription. We'd love to get in contact with you and kind of do Catholic life, if you will, with you. Also, if you're wanting to learn more about the stuff that we've talked about specifically this Sunday, as well as you're just wanting to understand more about about the beauty and richness that is traditional Catholicism, you'll see the link for my show in the description below, The Traditional Thomist. I recommend going over and giving me a subscription there. You will not be disappointed for we come out with all kinds of content related not just with uh, Catholic uh, good sermons like this, but also information on moral theology, dogmatic theology, Thomistic philosophy, so on and so forth. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. And as always, may our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. And may St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Alphonsus Liguori pray for us all. God bless.